Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Dr. Rao, it's Shannon Switkowski here. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to our final week of Cardio Echo. And um, if, if you have any uh, technical difficulties this morning, uh, please contact Rick or, or uh, chat here and we could try to troubleshoot. Um, I'm Shannon Switkowski, the clinic coordinator, and, and we'll start with the hub location. I'm Rick Carnacci, I'm the web content producer. I'm Jim Warner, a behaviorist and health educator. Jesse Lewis, program manager. Okay, and Dr. Rao, it's to you. Thank you. I'm Gotham Rao, I'm the director of ECHO. And uh, this, as Shannon mentioned, is our final week of this particular series. These are our particular disclosures today, and you can read those. Uh, at your leisure, if you wish. And uh, we're gonna talk about the future and wrap up this week. So uh, this is, is probably a bit of a slower paced session than what we've had over the last few weeks, only because we don't have cases to present. We don't usually present cases on the last week because there's no opportunity to readdress them for one thing. And plus it's an opportunity, I think, for participants to ask any specific questions they might have. So next slide, Rick. So after attending this brief session, you should be able to describe two emerging pharmacotherapies, uh, three endoscopic treatments, as well as describe the changes in bariatric surgery over the past decade. Now, when I talk about the future, we are to some extent talking about the immediate future. Um, yes, 30, 40 years from now, things are gonna be very different. I don't know, maybe there will, maybe we'll, we'll have tackled this problem, um, but, What's coming out over the next five years is the focus of this presentation. Next slide. So I want to draw your attention to Deborah Cohen. She is a brilliant um, uh, physician policy researcher at the Rand Corporation. And if you've ever, I, I used to have an appointment at the Rand Corporation, but if you ever thought you've written a really sound um, uh, grant, for the NIH or ARC or something like that, just send it to Deb Cohen and she will make sure you understand you haven't done that. Um, she provides really great feedback. And she's also a, a kind of a big thinker when it comes to obesity and, and, and uh, not only among adults, but also among children as well. Next slide. So these are, I think, the two of the most important statements from her particular uh, editorial. And I've had many, many discussions with her over the last 15, 20 years about uh, these things. And I think she's spot on. So it says the largest barrier to taking effective action is the mistaken belief that each individual has the capacity to ignore or transcend the food environment. She believes that's not possible. So we have a program called Fitter Me where we motivate, we identify motivated people and they are able to transcend the environment. Um, for time to time, and even those who are successful, we imagine will relapse in terms of their weight and will need help again. And that's why our program is designed to engage and re-engage people over a period of time. But she's probably right. Uh, if you put any, and we talked a little bit about the built uh, environment, if you put any mammal in an environment where there's lots of food and there's no need for physical activity, called a zoo, for example, the only wild, so-called wild animals that you'll find that have obesity are ones in zoos. Uh, and that's because they are, they are not able to cope with that, that uh, high caloric to food toxic environment. Now, um, the second statement I think that's relevant is reducing the salience, convenience, and ubiquity of junk food may be politically difficult, certainly is, I've certainly tried, but ultimately will be necessary. And I think that's probably her, her, her most profound statement. So we have no choice. Uh, things will get bad enough that people will recognize that we need to make major policy changes. As I said in the, in the talk about the built environment, this is the long-term solution. Uh, and we know it works um, you know, to varying degrees in how it's implemented. The, the most stereotypical and popular case right now is um, uh, beverage taxes on sugar-sweetened beverages, and which I've worked on for, for some time. Uh, we know they have some impact. There are three criteria, of course, to, to make sure they have an impact. The tax has to be sufficiently large. So one, one cent for a two liter bottle of Coke is not gonna make a difference to people. The money um, that uh, it has to apply to a broad range of beverages and the money has to be used for health promotion. But some jurisdictions have succeeded in passing these and there is a modest decrease in, in consumption as a result of it. So I think she's spot on. 
So let's keep that in mind. Let's keep in mind that this is our long-term solution. We've built our environment around cars and fast food for the last 50 years. It's gonna take at least 50 years to get back to a healthier environment. Next slide. So another question comes up is what on earth, wh what should we target? So I'm a part of something called the uh, uh, Physicians for Responsible Medicine Committee. Uh, this is led by Michael Jacobson, who's a very outspoken critic of sugar sweetened beverage companies, um, Coca-Cola, et cetera. And I think that he, um, he has uh, pointed out that we have largely won the battle against sugar sweetened beverages. Obviously with the Clinton Foundation, there's an agreement to remove them from schools. Schools are not permitted to make those available all the time. And then the second thing I think is that um, um, consumption has just naturally decreased due to greater awareness. So, you know, the, the joke is soda consumption is flat, um, uh, has been over the last 10 years there. And so a lot of the beverage companies are branching out into low caloric beverages, which is probably better. So uh, Michael believes strongly that why we have so much obesity that persists is because of refined grain products, uh, pizza, buns, that sort of thing. That's, that's the next, um, next real um, thing to tackle, but that's gonna be a long-term proposition as well. So let's keep those two policy type items uh, in mind as we move towards looking at what is in store for the immediate future, which is what is most relevant to your patients. Next slide. So let's look at pharmacotherapy to begin with. We talked about the range of pharmacotherapy, the six therapies that are available, including fentermine. Um, and that is actually a more promising landscape than we had 10 years ago when there was virtually nothing available. That was when uh, Meridia, Subutramine had just been pulled from the market and we were pretty much stuck with Orlistat um, and fentermine. So not a whole lot that was available at the time. So semaglutide is a GLP-1 agonist in the same family as liraglutide or Saxenda victosa. Um, it was developed by Novo Nordisk. <clears throat> and the exciting thing is that over the course of a year uh, with a daily dose at the highest level, uh, which in this case is 0.4 milligrams, we saw that in a, in a rather robust trial that they have published, this is from 2018, you saw about a 16.2% decrease in body weight over the course of a year. That is pretty good. When you think, consider that the average sleeve gastrectomy is about 35 to 40%. Now, all of these people, of course, had diet and exercise, but um, the feeling is that, okay, if we can combine this particular GLP-1 agonist with another drug that's some one of the ones we talked about, maybe it's Contra, maybe it's Crisimia, maybe it's another, maybe it's just metformin, I don't know. Um, maybe we can get to 20 or 22%. And once we reach 25, 30%, when we're starting to approach the same outcomes, this bariatric surgery for far, I mean, it, these are expensive medications, no doubt about it but for far less money, uh, far lower risks in terms of surgical morbidity, mortality, we are starting to see a change in the future direction of obesity treatment. Um, that, this is coming in 2020. So we have, I, haven't, I have not prescribed this yet for obesity. Um, it's not, uh, it, this is indicated for um, diabetics, obviously, who have obesity, but we are able to start doing it. The issue we're having, of course, is coverage for it, but this may be, a, a more powerful type of GLP-1 agonist. And I, I think within March or April, I'm gonna start using it for obesity as well. So it's not far off uh, by any means. Next slide. So other GLP-1 agonists, this I think is from um, um, AstraZeneca or is codatatide, which has a similar effect to semaglutide. This is in final testing right now, I think phase three trials. So we may see approval, I think they're estimating in late 2020, uh, and it can be used for both diabetes and obesity beginning in early 2021. Um, so not too far off. Now, these are expensive drugs. Uh, they're $1,000 a month on the average, uh, but um, to preserve their market share, um, sex, the makers of Saxon are gonna lower their cost to, to quite a bit as well. So, so um, there, there are some changes in the landscape in GLP-1 agonists. Next slide. So stay tuned for that. Okay, so here's another uh, direction that people are heading in in terms of uh, pharmacotherapy. So set melanotide. Now it sounds like a GLP-1 agonist. It is not. 
Um, it is an investigational MC4R agonist. So it's not, it, it acts basically in the brain. Um, and it's, uh, it's going to be used for rare genetic disorders of obesity. Now these are extremely rare. So for example, leptin deficiency affects about 200 people in the United States. So pretty rare. And you're wondering, well, why would a drug company want to develop something along these lines? Well, um, there are some compelling reasons. I mean, rare diseases are rare, but the treatments are extremely expensive. And so there is a scope for profit there, uh, like it or not. But the exciting thing about this is that MC4R defects are very, very common. So you notice the, the uh, fifth line down that says MC4R pathway heterozygous obesity. So about 4% of all uh, people have some sort of MC4R defect. And the interesting thing about these people is that their appetite is significantly more difficult to control, even among people that are at a healthy weight. So you have somebody, let's say, who's 130 pounds. If they had an MC4R defect, they would be maybe 138, 140 pounds. They just have a natural tendency to eat more. Uh, they don't have that satiety. Uh, if this becomes very useful for people with rare causes of obesity, of course, they'd like to expand the indications to include the, the much larger population of people with heterozygous obesity. And who knows, maybe it works in people who don't have defects as well, to promote satiety. So that's the, the promise. This, I would say, is not happening in 2020. They're still doing their research right now. We're probably looking at late 2021 or 2022, but still that's within the scope of our our, our practice over the next few years, unless someone's planning to retire very soon. So you will see this um, come out uh, fairly, fairly soon as well. Next slide. Now that is the landscape of pharmacotherapy. Of course, there are investigational drugs that have been, uh, people have been working on for five or 10 years. The problem, I, I don't want to discuss those because I think we think, oh gosh, there's all this, these exciting developments because we don't know if they'll ever get approved. Uh, they're in early stage testing and the availability is going to be an, uh, a limitation. Now, of course, these are all going to be expensive treatments. We talked about when to use pharmacotherapy. You want a motivated patient. You want a time frame around prescribing any sort of pharmacotherapy. Now, it's often given, of course, uh, after you've instituted lifestyle changes and there is a degree of frustration there. The last thing you want is a patient to give up on their lifestyle changes, et cetera. So I think all of those apply to any new pharmacotherapy that comes out. So even um, semaglutide is 16% weight loss in a year, that's very impressive. But if somebody just does semaglutide, just injects semaglutide, and there's an oral form that's coming out as well, just takes it every day, that's not gonna do a whole lot unless they pay careful attention to lifestyle changes as well. So keep that in mind. Now, what is happening with surgery? Um, a few things um, that don't necessarily apply to this series. Uh, that are pretty exciting in some ways, I suppose. Um, but there's been a, a radical transformation in how we think about bariatric surgery just since 2012, uh, just over the last seven or eight years or so. So the most common bariatric surgery in 2008 was uh, gastric bypass. You all remember even ads on TV, I think for the adjustable gastric band, it's turning out to be a bit of a disaster. And something called a sleeve gastrectomy, which is very, a very simple operation. Basically, you cut out a piece of the stomach and you staple the rest back together. So you make the stomach smaller. And it used to be a temporizing operation, but now it's, it's seen as a permanent solution. Uh, right now, um, gastric bypass in 2012 uh, declined. The band has, is, has now virtually disappeared. And the, the sleeve gastrectomy is now actually in 2018 is the most common procedure. The band um, is associated with a lower degree of weight loss, much lower degree of resolution of uh, diabetes, uh, lots of complications, slippage, et cetera. So it's pretty much gone out of favor uh, completely. Next slide. So this makes you think um, about mechanisms a lot. And I watched, you know, it was actually just a documentary uh, on, it was not, it's not meant for the general public, but for people, for healthcare professionals. Um, and it described a bariatric surgeon who was American based in San Diego. Um, and he uh, would uh, drive every uh, couple of times a week to Tijuana where he, he ran a bariatric medicine clinic there. 
where they were using balloon treatments for obesity. And he also did bariatric surgery in Tijuana as well and in San Diego. So he's a busy guy. And he, he made a very profound statement and he said something to the effect that within five to 10 years, uh, bariatric surgery would appear to be barbaric. And you know, when you really think about what's going on, I said, well, maybe he's got a point here. And he talked about space occupying lesions and balloons, uh, which have quite a long uh, history as well. So the first was the Garen Edwards uh, gastric bubble which was approved in 1984. So you can think about it almost 36 years ago. It's placed endoscopically in, in, in the gastric space um, and was filled with approximately 200 to 220 milliliters of air and it was free floating. Now, already you can see that this may be problematic. This is, remember, it's 35 plus years ago. That's a big, big bubble, um, first of all. Um, and uh, secondly, uh, the actual silicone around the bubble itself is, it was fairly, uh, fairly heavy itself. So it was very, very palpable in the sense that people could feel it. It was removed at four months um, and it caused a substantial amount of weight, um, weight loss, um, about um, seven to 10 kilograms, which is very, very good for, for four months. Now, um, the issue has been, of course, that uh, uh, the weight loss is quite rapid. Um, the mechanism at that time, they were not all that clear about. It may be a delayed gastric emptying. It may be s signals uh, sent uh, from the, you know, along the gut brain axis to promote satiety. They didn't investigate the mechanisms, but this is something that's been around for a long time. Lots and lots of complications. About half the people had a serious complication. They had to remove it. Um, spontaneous deflation was a major issue as well. Uh, the majority of people in those early days developed ulcers in the stomach. And within about eight years, the FDA withdrew approval for it and then said, no, this balloon idea does not work. Um, and so there was no approval of anything of that sort until 2015. Can you believe it? Um, so quite, uh, quite a long time afterwards. Um, 23 years afterwards, did we see another bubble, uh, another balloon being approved. Next slide. So then they had a, a workshop uh, around that time uh, and they set out parameters for what would be uh, an appropriate type of balloon treatment. And still the mechanism was not all that clear, but they wanted higher quality silicone. They thought it would be best to fill it with liquid. Uh, of course, it has to be radio opaque and it has to be adjustable and you have to have a, a large um, with no prior gastric surgery. Next slide. So these are the balloons that are available now. Uh, one is called Orbera. It's a single uh, liquid filled balloon uh, that is placed and removed at six months. All balloons are removed at six months. And you see quite a significant um, amount of weight loss. Um, so absolute weight loss at 12 months is about 11 to 12 percent. Um, in a European study, it was uh, certainly more effective than that. You can see that diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension decreased as well. And these are, this is af after they've been removed at six months or so. This is available throughout Ohio. Um, the balloon itself is placed endoscopi endoscopically and removed endoscopically. Next, next slide. Uh, the reshape is a dual uh, saline filled balloon. Again, uh, roughly the same uh, amount of effect. Uh, and you look at it, uh, I, we don't have this, I don't believe here in, in our healthcare system. It's, some of you are in Cincinnati, I think they do that over there. But um, it's, uh, it's quite a lot of saline, one liter of saline almost, right? 900 mils, so it's almost one kilogram of, of uh, liquid filled uh, balloon in your, um, in your um, and uh, of course, you get a significant weight loss associated with that as well. Next slide. So this is the balloon that we uh, have a business plan for. We have not actually placed any yet because the company itself has been a little bit difficult to work with. This is a series of three balloons. Uh, Oblon, one is swallowed at time zero, then at one month, then at two months. Uh, They're swallowed and then inflated with a catheter. Uh, with a proprietary gas, then you take a fluor fluoroscopy 
of the balloons. Uh, you detach the catheter and then you, um, they are free floating and there's no sensation of these at all. They're all removed endoscopically, uh, collectively at six months. You get about 10% body weight um, uh, overall at about the six month point. And the top quartile actually loses a quite a bit of weight. So it's one of those things where you either are a real responder or not. Um, this company is doing, you know, none of these companies are doing great. Uh, the problem is no insurance company covers any of these things. The cost is all the same for all of them. It's about eight to $9,000 with including the endoscopy, fluoroscopy. Uh, my time as a physician and the swallowing and the viewing of the fluoroscopy, all this stuff is very, very expensive. Um, but people, I think the, the thing is that this is now an established concept and people are moving along this direction more aggressively. And we'll see a lot in the next two years and hopefully it'll be much less expensive. Next slide. So all of these uh, act in different ways. Um, if you think about bariatric surgery or, uh, or the balloons, and now I don't have the balloons here, but they all have some degree of, of um, satiety, uh, modifying some of these hormones as well. So I think as we move through 2020 and 2021, people are no longer just interested in how does a balloon work. And it's not so simple as to say, well, you've got less room in your stomach, so there's less room to eat, so you feel full faster, which is of course the, the simplistic explanation. It, it's probably more complicated than that. Um, certainly people are, are able to eat uh, till they are uncomfortably full, no matter what's in their stomach. But we are going to see investigations, not only in the mechanisms of action, of bariatric surgery procedures, but also into balloon treatments as well. Next slide. Uh, this is something that is almost out. It's called Plenity. Um, and just presented, so this is hot off the press, October 29th. So just over a month ago at Obesity Week, which I did not attend. So Plenity is a cellulose-filled capsule and this is an idea, I think, I think everybody kind of comes up with this idea. I certainly thought about, uh, you know, you've probably had those Rice Krispie squares before. I don't especially like them, but you would think a Rice Krispie square, the way that it's, it's built, would absorb a lot of water, you know, just the way you think about it, like a sponge, right? So if you ate a couple of Rice Krispie squares and then you drank water, you'd probably be full. And the Rice Krispie square might only have about 200 calories. So just a, almost like a meal replacement. But this particular um, company makes something that is a cellulose capsule that once you drink water, it expands and promotes fullness. And they had some very impressive uh, data. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, about um, 16, 17% to weight loss, very highly motivated research subjects, uh, definitely. Um, it is, has full approval they do not have any marketing plan or distribution yet. And I went to their website and they're looking at um, probably late January, early February. So all you do is, I guess, um, before you eat a meal, you would uh, swallow one of these capsules, have a glass of water, and then presumably you'd eat a lot less or not at all. Maybe it could be a meal replacement. I think people will find that they're, they're used in different ways. I don't know how much it costs. I'm guessing it's not going to be cheap. I think it's going to be, uh, I'm guessing $15 per, that's what my guess would be, capsule. $45 a day, that's a lot of money uh, for something like that. Um, but for some people it might, be, might work. I don't think it'll ever be covered uh, by standard insurance plans. So we'll see how it goes. Um, the other thing I can see, just knowing the history of treatments of this type, um, the two things might happen. People might run out of money and not be able to afford the capsules anymore, or it just might stop working. You'll start to see, oh my gosh, I got used to this feeling. I'm starting to eat more and more each time. And then they're gradually, their weight will go back up again. But let's be optimistic. Let's see what happens. What's my bottom line? It's the bottom line everybody comes to. Policy changes to promote a healthier built environment are only long-term hope. Um, if you really think about what the difference is in countries that have high rates of obesity, like the United States or like Canada, versus similar countries at similar levels of development, like the Netherlands, um, there are, it's pretty, pretty different. I mean, Netherlands has, I think, 16% of their population has obesity compared to 40% here. 
and they're, of course, alarmed by that per se. People are generally much more active. There's much more active transportation going on. There is, you know, it's a rich country. There's all kinds of fast food and things that are available, but culturally eating those things is not something that is routine um, or widely accepted. There's a lot more fresh food. All of those things are societal phenomena. And to promote that type of consumption, I think, whether it's the Netherlands or Japan or Denmark or other countries that have seemed to have a much better handle on this problem is something that needs to start at the top. The other thing I think is, no matter how successful any of these new treatments that I described to you are, obesity is a chronic relapsing condition for which a number of treatments are available. That's the important thing is chronic and relapsing. We have a couple of patients in our Fitter B clinic that have been spectacularly successful. And I told one of them, I think it's great. I think you're gonna to get to the weight that you wanna to get to. But I guarantee you that over the course of 10 years or so, your weight's gonna creep up and you're gonna struggle at some point. And we need to see you as that starts to happen. That is normal. It's not a one-time solution. There's no one-time solution. And unfortunately, many of our treatments are designed to be single solutions and our patients perceive them to be single solutions. And that's not turning out to be the case. Look at bariatric surgery. We have a number of patients in our clinic that, are, um, that have undergone bariatric surgery, many of whom weigh more now than before prior to the surgery. So they've regained weight. And they all, I, I, they all perceive bariatric surgery to be the ultimate solution to their problem. It was gonna fix them for good. There's nothing like that available. And I don't think any of the new treatments will fall into that category. This congratulations on helping him to that degree. That's wonderful. And he's made some great progress. Um, even though he's male and men do have an easier time losing weight for a number of reasons, they have a higher uh, lean body mass than women, a higher resting metabolism. Naturally, even as they get older and throughout life, beginning at a very, very young age, um, they're more physically active naturally. So all of those advantages he has, but he's 67 years old, which is, which is the really remarkable, wonderful thing that first of all, he considered this important enough for his long-term health and he wants to avoid bariatric surgery. What can he do to maintain his progress? Well, the best lessons that I know of come from something called the National Weight Control Registry, which was run by Rena Wing, is, uh, who was at the University of Pittsburgh, but is now run by somebody else. What Rena did, was asked, I think it's 15, 18,000, I don't know how many people are in there, people who have lost weight uh, and kept it off for a period of seven years or more. I don't remember the specific criteria. And talked about, well, what are the strategies? What are the common themes here? There's a couple of common themes. The vast majority of those people did it on their own or with the help of a professional like, like Dr. DeWalker, not through Weight Watchers, not through Jenny Craig, not to fad diets. Uh, that's number one lesson. The second lesson was, and this is probably the most important thing, those who have lost a significant amount of weight incorporated a tremendous amount of new physical activity into their routine on a daily basis. We know that physical activity is, is not going to produce, especially at 67, walking daily even though it's wonderful, is not going to get them to lose a lot of weight. If you look at how many calories you expend doing it, it's a very small amount. Um, but, um, but on the other hand, people like Peter Kutzmarzik, who's down at the Pennington Research Institute, says, okay, as you get older, if you incorporate physical activity into a routine at a level that you were not even close to participating while you were losing weight or prior to it, you are much less likely to regain weight. And that's what we learned from the National Weight Control Registry as well. So all the healthy habits you carry out, you know, breakfast, no, nothing after seven, topiramate, whatever medicine he's on, we can keep him on that. But he's walking an hour a day and you say, okay, that's good. Maybe let's make it a little bit faster for the hour. Maybe it's a little longer. It sounds like if he can walk an hour a day, he's probably not working, I'm assuming. So he's got time. Mm -hmm. uh, and let him have that information. If you really want to avoid weight gain, you need to improve your level of fitness and activity and do it seven days a week. Um, some of you have heard of a show called The Biggest Loser, I'm sure. Now, there's a lot of problems with that show. I know the physician for it, Robert Hizenga, pretty well um, because he, he and I were trying to write this paper together a while ago. 
And Robert is uh, actually, he's a pretty good guy. He is a general internist um, who specialized in weight management and he was tapped to be medical director for the show. Um, the show has various um, strategies. The primary strategy, of course, you'll notice, you know, these guys are exercising twice a day, twice a day, the two hours of physical activity a day that causes weight gain. But now they've done some studies, they followed up participants after the fact, after they participated, the majority regained their weight. Of course, they don't have five, you know, professionals working with them all the time. That's the main reason. But those that did not, were still eating a lot of junk, but they were exercising twice a day for two hours. The other example I will tell you, and actually today and last week, I, ha I was out at, um, uh, in part of Geauga County, uh, where we're going to launch a community program. There's a lot of Amish there. The Amish have a relatively low rate of obesity. Uh, their diet is pretty atrocious. If you've ever, uh, a pro you know, it's not that great, um, but the average Amish a woman walks 17,000 steps a day and the average Amish man walks 25,000 steps a day. Remember our target is 10,000 steps a day. So that, that is the main factor there. So if this guy wants to keep the weight off, uh, he's got a physical activity, a huge part of his life. That's the lesson. Um, Chris, maybe we can start with you. Did you have any comments? Unmuting. So um, Great. Hi, Chris. I think I Good morning. Good morning. I think being able to capitalize on the success that he's had is really going to help in the motivation in the other areas where he struggled. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that he's been able, I was just astounded that he would walk an hour a day because even if you consider, think about carrying a bag of kitty litter um, up the stairs and that's an extra 25 pounds. And if they're carrying this much excessive weight, how much that is in terms of exertion. And if he's kind of doing it willingly and seeing results, um, I agree on increasing the intensity, but I think it can translate. And that amount of walking that he's doing is also translating and bringing his blood glucose down without um, insulin action. So I think kind of building on all of those and using a stepping stone to address the next steps um, becomes a really important factor. Um, so you can kind of keep building on that momentum because he's clearly overcoming a lot of previous um, lack of success. So those are my comments. Terrific. Thank you, Chris. Jim, any comments? The exercise is fantastic. And that is, uh, as I recall, exactly the amount of time on average that people in that long-term weight loss registry exercise per day is, is 60 minutes or one hour um, in seven days a week. And, and so he's already doing that. And the great thing about exercise too is as people become more fit and they do it regularly, they want to do it more. Uh, it's the toughest part is near the beginning. And you know, this could really be helping to is systemic inflammation. We know exercises helps reduce that. That may help with his cardiac risk increases endorphins, which in boosts mood, and that can also help with motivation. So, you know, it sounds like this patient is, is doing well and getting his needs met in the current program that you're working with him on. And, you know, I kind of see this as there are five things that people need for a, a long-term weight loss program. They need education, so you've already provided that. They need motivation. That's already there. You've probably elicited that. They need strategies to implement it. They need troubleshooting, and then they need ongoing accountability. And I think all those things right now are being provided by his visits with you, it sounds like. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't have any additional strategies or things to add to what you're doing. I think it sounds like it's working very well. Although, as Dr. Rouse said, it's a chronic relapsing condition. So it, it's very possible that he could kind of fall off the wagon at some point and then uh, can come back to you and uh, get restarted again if that happens. Great, thank you, Jim. Um, Sharitha, there was another lesson from the long-term weight control registry that, that we didn't discuss, and I'm sure he's probably doing this, and that's regular weighing, self-weighing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can see this guy. I mean, I, he sounds like an amazing gentleman for, for, for his age to make that much of a transformation with your help, of course. But at 67, he's lost all this weight. He's exercising vigorously. 
if he weighs himself every day, he can keep track of what, what um, triggering uh, any sort of regain of weight and any sort of relapse. And, and that's some of our most successful patients are doing that on their own as well. Yes, um, with uh, our practice, I ask our patients to, most of our patients to send me their weekly weights mm -hmm. to me. So they have been doing that. So that's been really working for them. It's a little bit Great. more in addition, just for more accountability. So, Wonderful. Yep. Thank okay, you. thank you. Let's just see what their opinion is. And they're gonna write me back a letter and let's go over it together. That's all I say at that point. And the third strategy I would say, is simply exploring what the specific concern is. And I guarantee you, most of the time, it's I had a friend who had the surgery and she died, or it's some sort of fear. Um, and uh, you have to respect that, of course. He goes, no, I understand that that might be concerning for you, but make sure she understands there is a concern in remaining with a high degree of obesity as well, that that's also a health risk in the long term, which I think a lot of our patients kind of underestimate. So they overestimate the risk of surgery, underestimate the risk of a high degree of obesity for a very long time. Now, she is uh, our core demographic in terms of uh, patients at Fitter B. She's African-American. She's 45. She has some comorbidities. Um, and uh, Anissa had mentioned, you know, stress, and she's, she fits the profile. She's got a couple of kids. The dad is not involved. She's struggling with all kinds of things. Um, how we reach this population is something Jim and I are, are thinking about carefully. We know it's not a genetic thing because genes don't taste change over the last 30 years, right? That doesn't make sense. Um, it's interesting that men are less affected in that community that women are. So these are things that we need to explore significantly. One route that um, um, a former student of mine who was African um, from Oakland, California was studying was returning to more traditional diets and traditional foods from the South uh, and the idea of cooking. And hey, this is, this is a more of a heritage approach to it. Right. Um, we know people who have traditional diets. So my parents, I assume yours as well, grew up in India. They did not uh, have a lot of fast food or McDonald's, that sort of thing. Right. So we know that people who pursue a traditional diet are more likely to be healthier. The most commonly studied group is are Japanese Americans. So that's one approach to it. But that's a long term proposition. I think the bigger question is how does she balance her busy, hectic lifestyle and the challenges she has with this high degree of obesity? And, and trying to get to a healthier weight. So I can comment, I, you know, I, those are my suggestions about getting her some help with discussing bariatric surgery. But Adam, did you have any thoughts about how she can deal with some of her other challenges? Assuming Adam's on, I can't. Um, I, I don't know that I have a specific thought about that, but I, I guess I, I wanted to make a comment that maybe sort of ties together this case and the prior case and your, uh, your I thought, excellent wrap up, Grotha, which is that I think there's also one layer we haven't talked a lot about as a group. First, she's doing some really excellent things by involving her family in physical activity. And hearing you talk about that just reminded me that in addition to sort of policy change and built environment change, there are also the possible for each of us to see ourselves as sort of uh, agents of cultural change toward health and cultivating um, really sort of a network of allies among our patients and encouraging them to do the same sort of thing. So that um, thinking about the first patient presented and this patient, that one of the things that that helps support people in continuing with physical activity or dietary change is that they're part of a community that also does those things. And so that if they're not, one way to do that is to encourage them to grow that community. So whether it's the first gentleman, can he walk more? It, does he have a brother or a neighbor or a former coworker who he can begin walking with? Um, and for this woman, you know, uh, who are her kids' friends who they can um, participate in social physical activity with, right? 
So that, um, you know, and I, I think that this is really consistent with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's focus on building a culture of health. And so we're not going to do that in simple sort of person to person relations in the exam room. And where that's really going to happen is extending the reach of our work in healthcare out into our communities. So I, I think that there's some real opportunity with both of these patients and patients like them to um, really build communities that are engaged in healthy eating and, and, and uh, more vigorous exercise. Thanks, Adam. That's a great suggestion. I mean, sort of my, I won't call it a fantasy, but my dream is uh, with our Fitter Me program is that we would be able to transmit the knowledge that is nothing exceptional about achieving and maintaining a healthy weight to peer leaders within communities, within families, and that they would then um, multiply, that they would be multiplying effects and, and transmitting core habits throughout um, particular communities. Um, if you look at obesity as a mathematical equation almost, I mean, there's so many behaviors on a public health level that contribute, but there's only about six or seven that contribute disproportionately, fast food being one of them, skipping breakfast, uh, caloric beverages, lack of physical activity and screen time. Um, those are those are big ones, and and um, uh, not sitting down with rushing meals, eating in front of t television. If you if you just if everybody had healthy habits with respect to those six or seven, of course there would still be people who had overweight or obesity because they have binge eating, etc., or they just have you know a lack of satiety control. But we could focus all our energy on those people because the rest of society would be would be much healthier. It's like Smoking cessation, yes, there's lots of causes of emphysema, right? There's alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, there's occupational exposures to coal dust, et cetera. But let's face it, it's smoking, right? Smoking is number one. So if nobody smoked and nobody smoked for the next 50 years, emphysema would be a rare disease and those people who were affected could get our full attention in addressing their treatments. So, so a lot of that is really, really helpful. Um, one comment from Dr. Rora, obesity group visits can be helpful in creating that community. Wonderful suggestion. That's exactly what we're planning to do here in Cleveland as well. Um, before we move on, I just wanted to see, uh, Jim, if you had any comments about this case. Yeah, um, you know, along those lines, I think, I think what this patient probably needs most is ongoing support and accountability. And that can be provided in, in many different ways. Talked about, uh, Dr. Rao just talked about uh, support groups, group visits, uh, things like that. If those things don't already exist, of course, the, the visits with the provider can provide support and accountability to a certain extent. But different people need that in different at different amounts. And uh, one way to do this too is just to ask the patient if there's a friend, uh, a, a family member, a sister, uh, someone she can simply talk to on a weekly basis or even more often about how it's going. And that person can, in a gentle way, keep them accountable. Uh, people just wanna be able to talk with someone else about the struggles that they're encountering and, this, and celebrate the successes they're having. And we find this for patients that come into the, to our clinic is they really just wanna tell the story of how things are going and have someone really listen to them. So that can happen you know, within families, uh, friendships, so, so forth. So, I encourage you to perhaps suggest that to the patient and see um, if they can be able to do that in some other way too. Great, thank you, Jim. Chris, uh, last word to you if you've got some comments. Uh, sure, um, just two quick points. One, uh, uh, building on Adam's comments around the family and uh, concern about their children um, adds an extra layer of accountability that Jim was kind of mentioning because um, she is concerned about her children. And I think a lot of times we can convince parents to do things not for themselves, but because of the um, benefit for their kids. Um, so I think that becomes an important aspect within this. And then the other point is the fact that she was motivated enough to go to uh, the nutrition courses, which I think are very helpful to give people that kind of baseline set of information. Everybody knows eat fruits and vegetables, but it comes to their behavioral and situational aspects of how do I make this happen for me and how do I make it routine and how do I do that, that I think the individualized counseling gives that capacity to translate that knowledge into behavior. Um, 
and knowing that they're a public insurance individual, they're probably also eligible for other programs that could help like SNAP. Um, I'm not sure how old the kids are, it could be a WIC eligibility. So the ability for some food assistance programs that might help bridge that gap of having food, having resources, um, and kind of getting over that eating out potential issue because I'm sorry, a double cheeseburger for a dollar is cheaper than cooking at home, unless you can get support for having that food at home. So those may help with some of those aspects that she's talking about wanting to cook more at home and controlling portion sizes and things. Great, thank you, Chris. Well, it has been a great pleasure spending the last uh, 12 weeks with all of you. Um, this is just the beginning, as I always say, it's not the end, so ECHO is a community of learners. Um, it's like our Fit or Me program. We never let anyone go. You're not discharged from our program permanently, so you're not discharged either. Uh, I believe, and Shannon can comment on this, we are planning kind of a conference of some sort next year to bring a lot of uh, former participants here in Ohio together. I'm assuming it's going to be in Columbus, which is relatively uh, central. And of course, we have our cardio uh, annual meeting as well. It'll be our third meeting coming up. So look forward to seeing all of you then. Uh, terrific cases. I think I've learned as much about uh, the issue from you guys, uh, hopefully, as you know, Adam, um, Jim, Chris, and I have presented to you as well. So wonderful experience, and thank you for that. So last word to Shannon, please. Great. Thanks, Dr. Rao. Um, and in addition, we're going to send everyone a cohort um, contact list after today's session is over. Uh, um, so that you can continue to have any conversations with each other um, on your own. Uh, so you did receive a post-clinic survey for today's clinic. Um, next slide, please. Um, as well as the post-clinic survey, you, will you have already received an exit survey. Um, please complete the exit survey by Friday, January 10th at 5 p.m. Um, that's quite some time, but we hope that you'll take some, some time to, to carefully answer the questions uh, with some thoughtful responses so that we can evaluate our full series. And in addition, if you wish to claim CME credits on next Tuesday, you'll receive um, a, an email from myevaluations.com. You will need to register with myevaluations.com to begin the process of claiming CME credits. Next slide. You can watch our ECHO clinics if you register on our website. Uh, Rick has done an excellent job archiving all of them. And uh, this one will be live shortly. And final slide. If you can't get enough and you want some more, we have the Bur Re Reducing the Burden of Hypertension series starting in the spring, January 16th and it's the same 8 to 9 a.m. on Thursdays, you can register on our website as well. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure meeting all of you.